Good evening, everybody. Welcome back. I hope that you've had a good week and that you are feeling vigorous and prepared for the end of the semester. We've got, what, a week and a half left and we're right at the end. So I imagine that you're very busy writing papers and preparing for exams and studying. I empathize with you and I know that we're under a very difficult circumstance. Many of us are working multiple jobs and taking care of family. We may not have a good workspace. Um, and I'm right there with you. It's pretty loud in my building tonight and I had to take refuge in a, in a room that I don't usually teach from. So um, we all have to make sacrifices big and small, but I'm very happy to be with you here tonight despite some of these challenges, and I'm really happy that you are here too. Before we get started, um, first thing I wanna do is just address the uh, final paper. It, it, it's a question that just came up in the chat. Can I elaborate on the final paper? Remember that with the final paper, you wanna extend the outline or the approach that you describe on the short paper. So we had, the, the short paper where you address a question that you've chosen from the syllabus, where you identify first the question, the key underlying debate in the literature that this question relates to. This question in this debate will be discussed in the reading for that week that that question comes from. So this is gonna come from the Norris or the TRL book where you'll find this information in this context in this discussion of the literature. It also will come out of you know, many of our lectures for the course. The rest of the, the short paper was devoted to outlining your approach to, to answering the question and, and what kinds of evidence you'll consider and, and what cases you'll select or, or what you'll do to make your argument. On the final paper, you're, you're carrying out what you outlined on that short paper. So that final paper is then your full response to that question. And this is a full engagement with that approach that you outlined and discussed in just sort of broad strokes on the short paper. So what that means is you're not duplicating or reproducing the exact same material from the first paper. Instead, you're just working with um, that same set of choices that you made and you're just extending them so that you can, you can write the full paper. Um, now what I've tried to do is set this up so that you've been kind of thinking about this for um, you know, part of the semester. I wanted to give you a short paper and a longer paper that would complement each other. It didn't make much sense to give you two separate types of assignments. And so, Theoretically, if you completed the short paper, you should be prepared to, to complete the final paper as well. Um, but of course, you will have to think about where you want to seek out some of the um, original information that you'll use to make your argument. And you'll want to also cite some of the literature from the class, as well as maybe some articles that you seek out yourself to, to incorporate. There is a lot of choice involved, and I trust that that you've put some time into it and, and taken some, some, some space to think about your options. Of course, I'm always available and I want to encourage you to reach out to me if you have questions. Um, the midterms have been graded. The grades have been uploaded. There are a few midterms that are still being graded because of um, some of the, the, the lag that, that came with some of the submissions, but most of them have, virtually all of them have, and I also have score sheets for each of you individually that I'm uploading tomorrow. Um, and so thank you again um, for being patient while we got the reader for the course. I'm glad that we finally did because now we can, we can, we can have some of this, this information that you need, frankly, to, to prepare for the end of the semester. So before we get started and continue with the rest of what I had planned, I'm happy to comment further on the final paper or take any questions that might have come up. The final paper is, is, is 3,000 words, which is about 12 pages double spaced. I would encourage you to refer back to the, the prompt on the syllabus, which does include 
um, a more detailed description. Arturo, the grades have been posted. Um, we'll be grading the short papers. If you're asking about the short papers, we'll be grading those soon. But we, we do have the midterms out of the way now, and we'll be move, moving to the short papers. Yes, James, the goal is to get you the short papers back before the term paper is due. Okay, if it says 2,500 words, then that's the limit. That, it's, an, it's a syllabus from, from the beginning of the semester. So I have three classes. It's, it's possible that I forgot. Are there any other comments or questions? Daisy, we don't have a final exam in the course. The university didn't create a time slot for the final exam and no one told me when I was hired or when I was assigned the class. And so I originally thought that, that there would of course be a time slot and I had no reason to assume that there wouldn't be. Um, but when I reached out to people in the administration in the university, they responded and said that if there's no time slot, it means there's no final exam. So we don't have a final exam and instead what, what we're doing is I'm going to give you um, what is essentially something like a final exam that you could submit for extra credit and you can use that extra credit towards your grade. I don't have a preference Elaine. You can use APA or MLA or Chicago just as long as you satisfy the requirements and as long as you're consistent. Casey. Yeah, no problem. Um, we should know within, I mean, I, hopefully by tomorrow. And, and um, I, I'm aware that there's a bit of a delay. I'm sorry about that. Um, but you should know by tomorrow. And I'll make it a priority to make sure that we have that by tomorrow. Are there any additional comments or questions? Thanks, Martin. I appreciate that. I appreciate the effort that you all put into the class, and that's what keeps me moving and motivates me. Jocelyn, so the final exam extra credit, <clears throat> the way it's going to work is I'm going to determine what is an appropriate amount that you can receive um, if you receive all the, all the possible credit. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll add that to the total points that that come from the three other assignments. So the midterm, the short paper, <clears throat> then, then the, the long paper. And I've yet to determine how many points can potentially be won back with the, the final exam, but I'm gonna make sure that it's generous and so that students have an incentive to do it. But the way it'll work then is I'll just add the points that you receive to your total from your other three assignments. And then it'll, it'll go towards you know, whatever you can win back, or in some cases, theoretically, you can get, you know, more than 100%, I suppose. Okay, so let's get started. Before we get started, discussing gender equality and women's empowerment in new democracies. I actually want to draw your attention to um, an interesting and relevant story in the news um, about democracy in Brazil. As many of you know, um, Brazil has a president, Jair Bolsonaro, who has been called the Brazilian Trump. He is this um, absolutely outlandish, um, it's been described as barbaric by some president who is popular and populist, um, but is also quite opposed by his, his rivals. And his rivals include opposition parties 
on the left and opposition parties on the center left. And in the 2022 elections in Brazil, Brazilians will have a chance to vote him out of office uh, or keep him in office. And the big story is that the opposition is looking for what's been called a uh, Brazilian Biden or a candidate who can unify the opposition uh, against Bolsonaro and, and get him out of power and replace him with someone more palatable. Bolsonaro has been called a semi-authoritarian and he does have a kind of hostility for democratic institutions that's similar to, to the hostility evident in, in Donald Trump. But the interesting and, and relevant part of the story for our purposes is that the challenge for the Brazilian opposition is the fragmentation of the opposition. As we've talked about, in Brazil, there are many, many political parties, and this fragmentation has made it difficult for them to cooperate and to govern effectively uh, and to often serve as a, a kind of counterbalance to Bolsonaro um, in, in power. And it appears as though this fragmentation might be, might be consequential yet again if Bolsonaro is, is able to remain in power and, and win re-election as a result of the, the fragmentation of the opposition. We know that young democracies often struggle with strengthening the party system and creating coalitions in opposition movements that can that can defeat dictators or that can strengthen democratic institutions or push through democratic reforms. This is the situation in Brazil um, at present and the future in Brazil will, will be closely tied to, to whether Bolsonaro is reelected or not. And one example of how Bolsonaro has <clears throat> served to sort of take Brazil back a few steps is the way that he has dismantled the Bolsa Familia program, which is a cash transfer program that was set up to pay poor families to send their children to school. The program was designed to advance literacy as well as, as um, give poor families more income. This was a very successful program, but under Bolsonaro, it's basically been dismantled and there've been no new enrollees and it's not even really financed by the state anymore under his government. And so that's just one example, but the consequences of his, of his administration have been very real. And so there's a lot at stake in the, the consolidation of democracy in the future of democracy in Brazil will be closely tied to the outcome of the election. Before we continue, does anyone have any comments about Brazil or about Bolsonaro? I think it's interesting to note that I, I don't know that much about Brazil, but I know Latin America in general, and I, not 100% sure, but I think it's been mentioned that Brazil has a significant amount of party diversity within its legislative coalition. So I think it's interesting that while, at least in the US, we think of Biden as the choice of nobody, the idea that he was able to win a national election and sort of take out the other candidate who is seen as unpopular would be really useful in situations that have a lot of pluralistic and diverse party societies where very few people can come to an actual agreement. Absolutely. Yeah, so the issue of fragmentation and, and unifying fragmented systems obviously is closely tied to democracy because as we read about and as we saw in this class, to form those coalitions and to unify the, the, the fragmented opposition, it, it means creating a movement strong enough to defeat a dictator. And dictators really, really benefit from divisions and they can divide and conquer, as we say. And so in Brazil, fragmentation of the party system has often been negative from the point of view of developing the democracy because it's it's meant that sometimes presidents have had more power but ultimately the brazilian democracy has remained relatively relatively intact despite the, the weakness of some of the parties at least as compared to say ecuador or peru does anyone else have a comment about brazil before we continue
Okay, so as you will recall, we are discussing gender equality and women's empowerment. And our starting point for this discussion was the fact that the deck is stacked against women everywhere. With some exceptions, like maybe Sweden or Rwanda, countries have not done a good job putting women in positions of power that are proportionate to the actual composition of their societies. In most countries of the world, women are half of the society, but in very few countries do they actually occupy half the, seat, the seats in the legislature or the parliament. And as a result, part of democratization in these societies has been promoting policies that are designed to expand the composition and the representation of, of, of women. Gender quotas are one way of doing this. And gender quotas involve setting aside seats in places for women in positions of, of power or institutions of government. And gender quotas have been very successful at facilitating representation in places like Rwanda, South Africa, and, and throughout Latin America as well. And where we left off was a set of perspectives or different causes or explanations of gender quota adoption. You know, why is it that these democracies adopt these? And one of the perspectives emphasized the ways in which women mobilize for quotas to increase their representation. And this is a perspective in an explanation that emphasizes the role of masses, right? The role of groups, collectivities, large groups of people, as opposed to elites. This perspective stands in contrast to perspectives that emphasize the strategic choices made by politicians who might, for example, want to expand their support among women. This emphasis on masses also stood in contrast to perspectives that emphasized ideas of equality and representation and notions of solidarity uh, or, or democratic progress being connected to, to equality. And then finally, this emphasis on masses also stood in contrast to a fourth set of perspectives that emphasizes the diffusion transnationally of ideas and norms um, of, of equality and, and, and women's empowerment. Today, we're going to think about the different questions that I posed to you when we left off last time. And we're going to connect those questions to a, a study of, of Chile. And we're gonna use the case of Chile to examine um, an example of gender quota adoption. And we're gonna look at this case through the lens of two key questions. First, do elites or masses cause gender quota adoption? And second, do transitions or stability create opportunities for adoption? These are two of the three questions that I, I left you off with on Monday. And the reason that I, I posed these questions is because these questions go to the heart of key themes and approaches in this class. Remember that the social forces tradition and the elite led traditions focus on different actors in different groups uh, in society who make decisions about democratic reforms or about democratization. And these different approaches make very different assumptions about, about the real origin of, of democracy. And we also saw another question about whether transitions or stability create more opportunities for change. We considered questions about whether democratic transitions lift normal constraints on action. We considered questions about whether periods of democratic stability uh, make it more or less difficult to advance reforms. We're gonna examine both of these questions in the case of Chile by looking at the adoption of a gender quota in a constitutional convention 
uh, for the rewriting of the Constitution in this country. This is an excellent opportunity for us to examine these different perspectives uh, and to try to get a handle on some of the key analytical issues that surround um, the issue of women's empowerment more generally. So our starting point is the example of Chile, the case of Chile, the country of Chile. It's a long strip of land, a narrow strip of land that borders the Pacific Ocean in South America. It starts in the Andes and it stretches all the way to Southern Patagonia, the very, very tip of South America. And in that long, thin country bordering the Pacific is a relatively conservative, inegalitarian society, a society where machismo has historically had quite a grip on society. Machismo is that sort of cultural underpinning, that kind of set of ideas about male dominance um, that have often influenced politics and society and the economy. Machismo has been especially consequential in Chile because of how Catholic and how conservative the society traditionally has been. If you go to Chile, you'll discover very quickly that machismo is a very controversial and divisive issue, um, and partly because of the strength of the feminist movement, which has made it an objective to combat and challenge machismo. This machismo has resulted in a culture of sexism and discrimination and gender-based violence. When I was in Chile studying and doing field work, my friends, my, my, my woman friends, would, would talk to me on a regular basis about discrimination at the workplace. Even educated women with, with good jobs um, often find themselves being underpaid or being taken advantage of um, in their working hours. For example, not being paid what they're owed uh, or being asked to do more than their male colleagues. Uh, just a lot of examples of inequality that are just persistent and, and just continue to kind of hover over society and affect the experience of, of women. But of course, it's not just discrimination and sexism, it's also gender-based violence, uh, sexual assault, and, and a variety of different forms of, of, of sexism and, and, and misogynistic behavior that goes hand in hand with the worst expressions of machismo. And this conservative sort of culture um, has been relatively insulated from significant change as well because of a lot of the difficulty changing policies in Chile, uh, given the 1980 constitution in particular. Today um, in Chile, this inequality and this machismo is on full display if you take a look at the composition of the legislature. So you'll notice right away that 75% of Congress people are men, despite that women represent 52% of the population. Um, that's better than in the United States, where an even smaller proportion of elected representatives are women, but it's not much better. And it goes to show you that um, even in a society where feminist organizations are quite strong, as we'll see, women have a difficult time making inroads at the very pinnacle of political power. And what this means in practice then is that policies that can improve the lives of women are much, much harder to pass. And those policies include policies that would expand access to reproductive services, policies that make it easier for women to access credit or to do things without the consent of, of someone else and their family and so on and so forth. And so one of the key challenges of democratization for Chile has been to open up the system to women and to incorporate women meaningfully into the democracy. And at this point, I'll, I'll quote Claudio Fuentes, who is one of Chile's best known political scientists and who is one of my friends. He said, among the first challenges of democratization for the country has been to open up the electoral system to allow the inclusion of sectors of society that have been historically underrepresented in structures of power. It's not just that machismo has created a culture of sexism and discrimination. 
It's also that democratic institutions have been affected by the inequalities uh, borne by machismo. And it's been difficult for women to access those, those structures of power. What is cultural also becomes political is, is the key point. And what this means then is that from the very beginning in Chile, democratization has been looked at through a feminist lens. And, and feminists in Chile have always been well organized and articulate and vocal and very combative and willing to confront um, hegemonic power structures and, and willing to challenge power structures. This is a photo from 1983 when in March of that year, the women's movement organized their first mass, their mass uh, protest in opposition to the continuation of the military regime. Their, their demand was, was quite simple and that was democracy now, um, the feminist movement demanded. At this point in the class, we know the example of Chile quite well. We've used it a number of times for reasons that we know well. It's a, a key example of a democratic transition and it's an example of a very strong military regime that was able to impose serious constraints on the functioning of the future regime. But even despite the brutality of that military dictatorship, women played a very important role in the underground opposition to the dictatorship. From the very, very beginning, women were involved in forming human rights groups, subsistence networks, and discussion groups. And these different types of groups formed essentially along class and social lines. Human rights groups were formed primarily by middle class and upper class women who were affected by exile and who were affected by uh, the brutality and the repression of the regime. Subsistence networks were formed by women who were concerned and focused on basic survival and often affected negatively by the economic policies of the regime, which included privatization and, result, and that resulted in high unemployment and, and scarce wages. And then discussion groups that were increasingly formed by educated women who had, who had remained very connected during the dictatorship, but only came out of, of hiding, so to speak, in the 80s when it became possible to organize more openly because of some of the preliminary liberalizations by the regime. It's also the case, and I should note that in Chile, despite how conservative the society traditionally has been, women were able to access universities as early as the 1870s. And so part of the story of the strength of the feminist movement is how well educated women have been traditionally, uh, despite how rigidly conservative the society was from the very beginning. And that's part of the story. By the 1980s, women in Chile had created a very dense organizational network um, around these different types of groups. And this created a foundation for uh, involvement in the, the protests for the, that, that favored and, and promoted and called for a democratic transition, but also for activities that would become important uh, during the post-transition period. And we'll see in a moment what those activities look like and, and how feminists have become well-known around the world in Chile because of their activities. And Chilean women became especially well-known because they would challenge machismo in very distinctive ways and they would take direct action. They would engage in occupations of universities. They would occupy public institutions. They would engage in mass protests directed at specific institutions. They would go to the doorsteps in the uh, stairs leading to the entries of, 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 of large institutions, the presidential palace, and they would stage large protests all designed to, to call for specific demands that were, that were often in keeping with, with the democratization of, of the society. And still today, um, Chilean feminists are promoting the same sorts of causes. And so these sorts of, of sites are quite common. 
um, coordinated protests that send a very clear visual signal about the silencing of women in their society and about the ways in which machismo has created a, a, a culture that silences and, and suppresses women systematically. And so this is a, a site that you'll see commonly a lot of, of visual signaling and visual messaging. One of the most distinctive representations of Chilean feminism is the, the occupation. And not just any type of occupation, but most importantly, the occupation of, of universities in public universities, as well as private ones. Um, universities are very important centers of public life in Chile. Education is valued considerably, but educational institutions are also understood as, as being places of solidarity and being places that, that are, are shared or enjoyed collectively. And so there's a kind of understanding that occupations are acceptable. And so in recent years, Chilean universities have been under occupation by feminist and student movements for extended periods of time, oftentimes weeks or even months at a time. And so images like this are quite common where you see what appears to be a, a clear takeover of, a, of, a, of an educational institution by the feminist movement. The feminist movement in Chile has also um, become well known internationally for its coordinated protests. And in recent years, one of the best known examples was this, this protest, you are the rapist. And basically the words are, you are responsible. Um, and the words are meant to paint the, the, the picture or, or send the statement or send the message that it's not what I'm wearing or my behavior, it's your choice in, 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 in your fault, in your choice, in your behavior. It's, it's an important but a simple message that resonates nationally and has had an important impact nationally, but has also been very effective as a global kind of clarion call. In fact, if you type in to Google Chilean feminists, you'll find dozens and dozens of videos of feminist movements all over the world mimicking this chant that, that, that was created by the, the Chilean feminist movement. This is another example of the coordination and how well organized the movement is. And it's another example of how effective they are at messaging and how um, their demands take on great import and how articulate they are in, in clarifying them. So this is a picture of the main thoroughfare in downtown Santiago. Um, I actually lived about two blocks from here when I lived in, in Santiago for four months. This is the headquarters of the Pontifical Catholic University, which is the, the top institution of higher education in, in Latin America. I'm telling you this because this, this headquarters was under occupation by a feminist movement, by the feminist movement for weeks at a time when I lived in, in Chile. And it was such a sight to see every single day to walk by and see the place basically boarded up. What they do is whenever they occupy a university, they always, they always go in and they take all the desks and all the tables that they can get from all the classrooms and they push them towards the windows so that they block the entrances to all the, all the entrances to the building. And they use everything that they can to basically seal off the entrance. But even in doing so, the authorities essentially permit them to do this. It's amazing, you can walk by and you can see these institutions under occupation by these, these huge groups of feminists. And at the same time, the military police will be like 15 feet away, just kind of patrolling the, uh, near the street, just kind of observing the situation and just holding the peace. It's almost as if there's kind of a cultural acceptance or understanding of the role of the occupation and it's become a part of the political process. Um, and the effectiveness of the occupations is, is without doubt um, enormous. They've been able to obtain a lot of concessions and the continued emphasis on expanding access to education in particular has been um, successful in, 
in continued improve in getting continued improvements in in access to education. So the situation in Chile is is one that can't be understood without focusing on the role of masses and in particular the role of the feminist movement, which is the best example of masses in this 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 case. All of this takes us up until the present, and the present is by far the most interesting and, and momentous point in recent memory in, in, in Chilean political history. This present is a, is a period of, of rapid change where the country is preparing to write a new constitution and convene a new constituent assembly and hold elections to, to approve a new constitution in the coming years. This is a moment where we'll pause and take a look at the process of social crisis and upheaval that the feminist movement has been a part of in the last year and a half. And we'll take a look at how this process has set the stage for um, the role of the feminist movement and, and women in the writing of the new constitution. This is a final protest before an historic election in Chile. The movement was initially sparked by a hike in the subway fare. But its overarching demand was to change the constitution, which was written under former dictator Augusto Pinochet in 1980. In an effort to appease protesters, President Piñera called a referendum on whether to draft a new constitution. Un acuerdo por una nueva constitución. It wasn't enough. We were blasted with water laced with chemicals, just one of the ways that police have forcefully tried to put down the protests that erupted a year ago. During that time, government forces killed at least six people, and they shot rubber bullets at protesters' faces, causing more than 300 people to lose an eye. <laughs> Fabiola Campiai had a tear gas canister shot at her face. She lost both her eyes and her sense of smell and taste. She's become a symbol of police brutality and the need for change. The day of the incident, what do you remember? My recuerdos son super poco porque, bueno, ese día estaba con un turno de noche en mi trabajo. Al llegar a, a la esquina de, del pasaje en donde yo vivo, eh, solamente recibí el disparo y de ahí ya no me acuerdo de nada más. What's the change that you want? El cambio en, en nuestra educación, en la salud, eh, vivienda, eh, en, el, en las leyes, eh, eh, en nuestra policía que hoy en día está vuelta loca por un decir, eh, eh, dispara sin, sin una provocación. Ya viejita, vamos. Espero que haya una soledad alta aquí. Levanta el pie, levanta el pie. Está mi amor. ¿Qué dije? Ya viejito, vamos. De un brazo a la mamá. Will justice come quicker with the new constitution? Yo creo que sí. Eh, esperemos que sí, que haya justicia eh, más rápido con la nueva constitución. Acá, acá le vamos a hacer el bote. Ah, ok. Todo así. Sí, ya.
Ahí. Ahí. Ya. ¿Cómo te sentiste? ¿Qué tal esta experiencia? Muy lindo el apoyo de toda la gente. Con el apoyo de ellos hemos podido salir adelante. Ay, gracias. Gracias. Critics of the current constitution say it codifies conservative policies. The constitution has been amended dozens of times, but people like political scientist Claudia Hayes take issue with its very legitimacy. I think the current constitution, it's a lock to maintain the way the, the things as they were when the dictatorship uh, uh, ended. And so, and it was designed for that purpose. It has prevented change from occurring through elections, through political parties. Many things that uh, people want to change are, are declared in unconstitutional. So you want to uh, make the water be public, it's unconstitutional. And you need to make it uh, happen, you need very high quorums to change the constitution. Do you think that this constitution is going to actually address the pressing concerns of so many Chileans? I think it's a first step in that direction. Of course, the constitution is not a social policy, it's not a social program, it doesn't have, it, it doesn't have a budget, but it can send a message to the political system. So in the worst case, even if the constitution is not perfect or not very consistent, I think any constitution would be better than the constitution we have now. That's Claudia Hess. It's not Hayes. Uh, Claudia Hess is one of my friends. Um, and she's a, a close friend and colleague of, of one of my co-authors in, in Chile, who's a, a professor at Diego Portales University. Chile is a small country, and so these people know each other, and it's kind of neat to see them on, on TV. But the reason that the feminists were so central to what took place is what happens next in the rest of the story. And the rest of the story has to do with the debates that were set off by this crisis, this uprising, this social uprising. And the uprising in the debates that, that emerged as a result related to questions about incorporating citizens in the process and making democratic reforms that would improve the situation in the country. The most pressing issue of all was the question of how to include all sectors of society in the process of writing a new constitution that would replace the 1980 constitution. And in particular, there was a focus on how to incorporate women and how to create an equal playing field and create an equal role for women in the process. The feminist movement emerged at this moment as a very, very important actor the feminist movement began pressuring the National Congress to establish gender parity in any constitutional convention. And what they were calling for was gender balancing or laws that would require there to be an equal number of men and women in any legislative body convened to write the constitution. And they began lobbying Congress persons. They began writing letters and generating political and public support. They began shoring up alliances that they had with other organizations and movements. And they began articulating this demand in every way that they could. And they drew on their organizational links that they had established during the dictatorship decades earlier. This is when those dense organizational networks became especially important um, in, this, in this example. And eventually, Congress gave them what they wanted and approved a mechanism to ensure balanced representation of men and women in both candidate lists and electoral results. And this was an extraordinary victory for the feminist movement, and it was a step forward for the country, a country that had so long been in the grip of machismo and had so long been affected by this, this culture of sexism and male dominance in, in misogyny. This victory, we cannot understate the seriousness and the scope of this victory. And you see here, both 
congresswomen and some activists celebrating the approval of candidate lists in, in party list uh, gender balancing requirements. This was such an exciting moment for the, for the feminist movement and for, for Chile. It's a moment that we should understand the gravity of in its totality. It's true, no other country on earth will have a constitution written by an equal number of men and women if Chile goes forward and does this. They will be the first country on earth to have this. And this is an example of a democratic outcome or a democratic reform if ever there was one, the rewriting of a, of a dictatorship era constitution. Now, Congress approved laws that would provide for gender balancing, but that didn't necessarily mean that the constitution would be written by a constituent assembly. That would still be up to voters to decide. And they decided in October, 2020, when voters were asked First, if they wanted a new constitution, and second, if they wanted a body of only newly elected delegates, a constituent assembly of newly elected delegates, or an assembly of half members being from Congress to write it. And this was a choice essentially between the establishment or between uh, the sort of new wave of, of potential political leaders or citizen or community leaders. And Chilean voters voted overwhelmingly to both write a new constitution and ch to choose a newly elected constitu a constitutional convention and to create it based on, on gender balancing without automatic inclusion of Congress members. And so Chilean voters basically voted for the, the most progressive of all options given to them. We want a new constitution and we want a newly elected constituent assembly without automatic inclusion of Congress members. Elections will be held in April 2021 to choose the delegates, but it is a certainty that it will be 50% women and 50% men as a result of the approval of provisions to provide for, for gender quotas in the, in the convention. And as I said, Chile will become the first country in the world with a constitution written by an equal number of, of men and women. This is then an exceptional achievement. And what I would like to put to you is that it's not possible to understand this without considering the role of masses in Chile and in particular the role of the feminist movement. If ever there was an example of the role of social forces, this is it. The capacity of groups of people acting collectively to bring about outcomes that they otherwise could not bring about. The capacity to force political leaders to make decisions that are not in their interest necessarily, uh, but that are advantageous to the group. Now, why do I say that it's not necessarily in the interest of Congress to approve gender balancing in the Constituent Assembly? Well, because in a sense, Congress was in competition with citizens who might be elected to the Constituent Assembly because voters had a choice between a newly elected body or a body half of whose members would be Congress members. And so any gender balancing rules would apply to the Constituent Assembly. And so creating those rules was to create, was basically a way or would basically create an incentive to create a constituent assembly um, of all citizens as opposed to half members of Congress. And so in this example, the interests of the elites did not coincide with the interests of the masses, and yet the, the masses got what they wanted, the feminist movement got what they wanted. We can say what Claudio Fuentes said, the feminist movement was key in pressuring for and enabling this extraordinary result, the creation of a framework for a, a constituent assembly, 50% of whose members are men and 50% of whose members are, are women. And so what this illustrates is the role of masses as well as the role of periods of instability. And we've talked a lot about obviously the role of masses in this case, but let me pause and discuss the role of instability. 
the entire beginning of this story relates to the social crisis and the political crisis that resulted from the upheaval in October and November of 2019. That was a period of instability, if ever there was one. That was not a period of politics as usual. It was precisely that moment, that period of instability that created an opportunity for the feminist movement to pressure Congress to adopt measures that would advance gender balancing in any future constituent assembly. It was this moment of instability that created an opening that could be seized, an opening that could be filled by the feminist movement. Remember that the role of these openings and the role of this instability is that it reduces the normal constraints on action. It creates an opportunity for action that did not previously exist. By contrast, periods of stability don't create the same opportunities unless political actors find an advantage to, to advocating for particular groups in exchange for their political support. But this period of instability that was the upheaval, that was the social crisis, created a, a chance for the feminist movement to rise to the surface and to push through this this landmark legislation. And that's precisely what they did. And so in the end, what I would suggest to you is that the world over has a lot to learn from feminists in Chile and not just women, people everywhere, men and women and non-gender conforming individuals as well have a lot to learn from this example of solidarity in mass political action in protest in occupation and this unwillingness to accept um, second class status and this unwillingness to accept a world where the deck is stacked against them. And I can tell you from experience that the Chilean feminist movement is extraordinary. I participated in marches uh, in protests with friends and colleagues and I saw for myself and, and met leaders and saw for myself that they're extremely well organized and very, and very disciplined. And so, this is the, the way that politics works. You articulate demands, you organize yourself effectively and you throw your weight around. And this is what they do very, very well. And so as we begin to think about the big picture, I want to pose a series of questions that can ignite discussion. And I want us to think broadly and think about the lessons that come out of this story in, in this, this example of, of Chile that we've done so much to investigate at such a detailed level. The first question that I wanna ask you is, what can feminists in other democracies learn from their Chilean counterparts? Well, I was thinking maybe uh, the grassroots organization of, uh, of social programs or, or social movements like the feminist movement will probably um, convince the electorate to vote in favor of those movements. So just the organization that the Chilean case had was just, you know, so astounding. Yeah. So one of the big insights that comes out of these examples is that when people are well organized, they're effective. And that means creating networks, that means creating groups that have a common interest and that have a common objective. And what's interesting and kind of ironic um, is that the repressiveness of the Chilean dictatorship actually became a cause of the organization of the Chilean feminist movement. 
it was so repressive that it caused people to organize themselves in a disciplined way, precisely so that they can resist the dictatorship. When you give people such a reason to fear for their life, they will organize themselves effectively to save their lives. And so coming out of the dictatorship, Chilean feminist movements were, were very well organized for that reason. And they had the capacity to articulate demands that were very, very aligned with other groups in society who also would benefit from democratic progress. And so from the beginning, as Giovanni points out, they were in a good position to sort of build coalitions, right? And kind of win the support of other movements. And that's one of the reasons that they've been so, so effective and so successful. Tyler says to move in masses and that change only happens over time. Yeah, that's important too, right? Like this began in 19, this began in like the late 1970s. The, the decision to adopt gender balancing is really the culmination of decades of effort and hard work. It takes time and you have to have the ability to imagine something taking place over a long period of time. And you've got to be able to invest time and money and resources over a a period of time. And one way that organizations also help to accomplish that is that organizations and institutions have a memory, right? They, they have a, a capacity to remember what they did and what they learned from their experience. And when you create something that is permanent, they have records and archives, and they have the ability then to, to sort of generate momentum and to learn from experience and to learn from trial and error. And things take time and politics takes time. And so in this case, what began in 1983 culminated in 2019 and 2020 and will culminate further in, in the creation of a representative constituent assembly. Elaine says that a fight for change is possible, especially if you mobilize together. That's the most important point for me too, right? It was such an unlikely or such a, a difficult outcome, uh, but it was one that was, that was obtained through hard work. Gustavo says numbers equal strength. I agree. It, it goes to show you that the, the political power is partly structural, right? It has to do with, with you know, the, the shape of the group and the size of the group and the ability of the group to, to throw its weight around. Dulce says ongoing mobilization, absolutely. Martin says, in terms of message, don't be afraid to offend the establishment and don't just have a single issue to fight for as the moment you accomplish, accomplish your goal, you have no reason to fight or continue to exist as an organization. Having multiple battles and things to stand for also helps to spread one's movement among multiple groups of people beyond people who are like you. Yeah, <clears throat> that's right. And in Chile, the feminist movement They've been interested in gender balancing for a long time, but they're also interested in reproductive services and access to those services for women. They're interested in the quality and access to education. They're interested in the cost of public utilities. They're interested in the, the cost of childcare and the, the support of the state for childcare. They're interested in things that, that they're interested in for a variety of reasons, but that sometimes are distinct from the interests of other groups. And so when you, when you have that set of demands, you're in a good position to get something if you're strong enough to articulate them. And if you have political supporters, you may not get everything, but you'll, you might get something. And you know, sometimes if you demand something and if you don't have fear of, of calling out the establishment, as Martin says, you might get it. And so that, I think that's something that comes from this case. Yoel says that the Chilean feminist movement is essentially a fight for equality. Let's call it what it is, as well as for peace. We discussed a week or two ago that peace must be established and the lack of equality for women is where the struggle is. Their, abil their ability to mobilize and organize and be consistent is impressive, definitely not an overnight event. Similarly to feminism erupting in Mexico and the recent takeover of a federal building, Slowly but surely, it's, it's a growing waking movement. That's a really good example, um, Yoel. And I like that you emphasize that this didn't happen overnight. It took decades, right? And the capacity to, to mobilize and to organize, it's something that 
requires continual investment. And your example of Mexico is so important too. Mexico is one of those countries that has learned a lot from, from Chilean feminists. And when they take over and occupy federal buildings, that's a Chilean thing. It's sort of a Latin American thing to be sure. Um, but it's a Chilean thing without a doubt as well. And that's something that's been effective in, Ch in Chile. And if it becomes effective elsewhere, that could be really consequential politically. And it could be a, a game changer if there is a more democratic politics that could involve um, that kind of action. And if it could be a, a way of, of articulating demands that, that, aren't, that aren't taken into consideration you know, by elites. Who, who might have very different interests. I think that one thing that, that feminists and other democracies can learn from, from Chilean feminists is that well, I think that one thing that's really important is, is that you shouldn't compromise. You shouldn't, you shouldn't compromise. You shouldn't moderate your position. You shouldn't weaken your position. You should always demand the most that you could possibly get because inevitably you won't get everything and you will end up somewhere in the middle. So if you don't compromise, you'll end up somewhere in the middle and you'll get something if you compromise you may not get anything at all because by the time you move to the middle, you will have moved all the way to the other side. And in my experience, one of the most striking things about Chilean feminists is, is this, this intentional unwillingness to compromise. And sometimes they're criticized domestically by people in politics and by, by public figures for being so aggressive but I think it's one of their most effective qualities because they understand that articulating a clear demand in, and aggressively so in, in a demanding demand is the only way to end up with something at the end when inevitably you'll have given up a lot along the way or had to have given up something. Um, and, and so I think that not compromising is part of the story as well. And this is um, a, a lesson that's more difficult to learn often because I think that in politics, there's this, there's this, this sort of tendency to kind of give a little bit and into compromise, the idea that you must moderate. But sometimes when there's so much at stake and when the status quo is, is, is so unacceptable, um, even compromising at all might leave you with nothing in the end. Karen says, along with organizing themselves well, as you mentioned, I think the women's courage to speak her truth to the police, as we saw in the video, showed that she was willing to stand up to anyone, no matter their level of authority. Even after he shouted back to her to be careful about her accusations, that didn't discourage anybody. The movement went on. Yeah, Karen, I love that too. And when I watched the video, I immediately thought about that. I was like, that seems to be like a microcosm of the whole thing, right? Like the woman presumably doesn't know the 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 Carabinero, that's the name of the military police, the Carabineros in, in, in Chile. If you're a Carabinero, you're a, me a member of the military police. Presumably she doesn't know him, but she calls him a rapist. Why does she call him a rapist? Well, it could have something to do with the machismo culture, right? The, the sort of understanding that people have that, that it's a, it's a male dominated culture. It's a misogynist sort of sexist culture that, is rife with discrimination. And so from that woman's perspective, regardless of whether or not she knows him, you know, he's a, a member of the military police representing the state in a conservative, um, you know, pretty um, masculinist place. And so he is a rapist from her point of view, for, through her worldview, um, not maybe in a literal sense, but, but maybe in a kind of metaphorical way. And so, her willingness to call him a rapist and to refer to him that way suggested like a kind of aggressiveness and like an unwillingness to, to stand down that's, that's consistent with that unwillingness to compromise. But you can also see like the kind of agony and the anger, right? And the kind of um, the anxiety and the just, the, the above all, the just, 
the the anger and that's i think the 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 main emotion that we see there but in my experience too um the chilean military is extremely conservative it's a very conservative institution and so her assumption is probably partly born from her experiences that she's had in the past maybe with with interactions with the carabineros who can be very violent frankly and can be very aggressive and seem to in some ways take on the trappings of that kind of uh, machismo culture what i love so much about the the chilean example is that it really shows you the sort of interaction the kind of confrontation between the social groups and the state you've got the state in the police and the military you've got the social groups in the the students in the women um in the teachers and the unionists and the taxi drivers and so on the second question i wanted to ask you is would this type of approach work in the united states would occupations and mass protests be effective mobilization strategies for feminists um, do you think that that would go over well? Would that be effective? Why or why not? I think that sustained uh, occupation would be effective as I think there was during the Vietnam War, there were people who had also sustained occupations in American universities as protests. And while they played a smaller part in terms of numbers, a lot of those younger protests had a lot to do with the increased unpopularity of the war and sort of the mass development of increased protests. But in contrast, you see quicker stuff like Occupy Wall Street as an example that led to very little change in terms of like the financial system. So I think it requires sustained occupation or sustained mass protests in order for it to be effective. Yeah, and you know, Ishan's comment is consistent with what we learned earlier in the semester when, when we read about what types of mass action are effective. Remember, we, we learned that on the one hand, violence is less effective. Peaceful protests can be more effective because it draws out bad behavior by the authorities, which causes them to lose support. It exposes them. It exposes them to international criticism. It legitimates the cause of the protesters because it shows them as being peaceful and willing to use civil means, right, to engage in this kind of debate or this sort of negotiation. Um, and I think the example of Vietnam is an interesting example too. It has to be sustained though, perhaps, as Ishan says. It has to be something that is is done over a longer period of time in order for it to really be meaningful. Um, and when you have a huge movement, like in the feminist movement in Chile, you have that possibility, right? It becomes possible to engage in that sustained occupation or to use these, these, these approaches over the long, the long term, which they've done for decades. I think that in the United States, the feminist movement is certainly real and certainly exists, but I don't know if it's as well organized and as articulate as the movement in, in Chile. And so I think that one of the things that that, that feminists in the United States, and, and that includes anyone who promotes the, the cause of, of advancing equality, one thing they can maybe learn from Chilean feminists is is the benefit of, of organizing feminists in groups for the explicit purpose of of sharing experiences and insights. Of course, in Chile, they had the benefit 
of, of, well, it's sort of a perverse benefit, but living under a dictatorship that caused them to organize effectively in that way. In some ways in the US, the absence of that circumstance maybe influenced the, the potential for the formation of an equally strong movement. You know, absent a dictatorship, maybe there wasn't a, 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 a real spur for the formation of, of that kind of organizational consciousness. But occupations can still be effective. You know, for instance, can you imagine, can you imagine feminists occupying UC Merced? Would that be, would that be an effective strategy? I mean, maybe not right now, right? Because COVID is here. You know, when I think about this question, I think about how Native Americans who have occupied areas being developed by pipeline um, developers have been abused and, and, and repressed by authorities. And I, I wonder if occupations would be less effective here because of the willingness of the authorities to crush them. I don't know. I think that obviously Native Americans have it different than, than maybe women in general. And Native American women in particular have it worse than women in general. Um, but occupations have been received in a variety of ways and not necessarily always positively. I think that the general point for us is that mass action takes different forms and the, effect is, the effectiveness of mass action may depend on the types of of mass action taken. You know, in the end, democratic progress might depend a great deal on both elites and masses. And women's empowerment and gender equality are certainly two examples of democratic progress. Um, thank you very much, everybody. This has been um, an interesting and, and important discussion about a key case of, of mass action in women's empowerment. I hope you learned something good and, and new and, and noteworthy. I'll see you next time and I hope you have a good remainder of the week.